So hello everyone and welcome to the first conversation of the fourth cycle of conversations on corporeal architecture. My name is Maria de Pilar Freire and I am very happy and honored to have as my guest here today, Andrea de Paiva. Mm -hmm. Andrea de Paiva is a Brazilian master of arts and architects. She is the creator of Miroau, an international space for the dissemination of knowledge about the links between cognitive science and design with more than 30K followers and published articles and online courses for students from more than 30 countries. Teaching neuroscience for architecture in two Brazilian universities and working as a consultant in some of the most successful offices in Brazil. She is a member of ACE, an invited speaker at events in Dubai, US, Bulgaria, London, and Singapore. Andrea, wonderful to have you with us. Thank you, Maria. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, I will start sharing my screen. Just a second here. And there. Can you see my, my screen? Yes? Yes. Okay. Okay. So thank you, Maria, for the invitation to be here. I'm very happy uh, to talk to such a, an interesting group of uh, people. So I will start here my presentation uh, in which I will discuss neuroscience and spatial design discussions on what we need from architecture. Uh, the idea here is not really to give uh, all the answers, but more to uh, uh, inspire everyone to make more questions. And I do hope you will have a lot of questions for me after I speak here. So just a quick uh, understanding about what we are going to talk today. I won't talk a lot about who am I, who I am, because Maria already uh, told you that, but we will focus on why neuroscience is interesting or important for architecture and design, what's the relation between architecture and the brain, and then I will go to the main question that I'm proposing here. What do we need from architecture? Of course, I'm not going to answer this question because it would like it's really a challenging question, but I will bring here some topics for us to think about some uh, primitive innate needs that we might have and that architecture and design and uh, even urban planning can help us to fulfill. And finally, we will uh, go to our conclusion, conclusions. Here, um, Maria told you who I am, so I won't spend time here. I just would like to invite everyone after this talk to visit the website NeuroAU or our Instagram or YouTube because we have a lot of content there, a lot of articles, uh, free access articles. So you are more than welcome to access them and ask uh, me any questions you have about them. You can write to me. I can share my email. You have my Instagram for that. Uh, and we have this great opportunity here to also discuss neuroscience for architecture. So, okay, our first question, why neuroscience if we are architects, designers, urban planners? So again, I could like, I spend all the time that I have just answering this question, but I will bring the two kind of answers here. First one, uh, why neuroscience? Because it helps us to understand how the physical environment can affect us beyond conscious perception. Because of course we are aware that, oh, I like this space or I don't, or I think it's beautiful or not, but this is something that we are processing uh, on a conscious level and neuroscience for architecture can help us go beyond that. So it's one of the, the main purposes, the main goals of uh, the field is to understand what, uh, what effects are happening on us beyond our conscious awareness. Maybe one of the most famous examples I can give you to illustrate what I mean is what Roger Ulrich found out in the 80s uh, when he was studying hospital design and he found out that uh, patients that were in rooms uh, recovering from a surgery in a room with a view to a natural landscape, they would feel less pain and recover faster. So those are two examples of uh, effects that go beyond our conscious awareness. People were not able to notice this, 
but because of the statistics of the study, he compared those people with people in rooms with a view to a wall, and, and he found out that there was a change in their recovery uh, and, uh, speed and also on, the, on their perception of pain. And my second answer to, the, the, to this question is that um, neuroscience help us understand the effects beyond behavior observation. So we observe a lot of behavior to understand how architecture is affecting people, but we can go beyond that. So for instance, I will bring here some studies showing that uh, natural light can affect learning in students or a feeling of happiness of people. But why does it happen? What is uh, happening inside our bodies that cause this change in behavior or in feelings, emotions, perceptions, health, and so on. So the idea is to understand the complete process and not just to look at the result. When I'm looking only uh, to the behavior of people, I'm just seeing the result. So I change something in the environment and I can see what happens, uh, how we respond to that. But I want to understand the entire process. So what's happening inside of us that will lead to uh, recovering faster or to learning better in a room that has natural light uh, and so on. About architecture and the brain, I really like uh, this, uh, this phrase that Fred Gage, a neuroscientist from ANFA, the Academy of Neuroscience for Architecture in, at the Salk Institute in San Diego. Uh, he was the guy uh, who, who said these changes in the environment change the brain and therefore they change our behavior. In planning the environment in which we live, architecture design changes our brain and our behavior. So uh, here he gives some ideas of the responsibility that we have as designers, because we are not just affecting uh, behavior, which is already something we are affecting the entire human experience with the spaces we are creating, and we are affecting also the brain uh, in a physical way, as I will explain in a while. So one of the first ideas that I want to propose here, and that I think is deeply connected with uh, the goal of neuroscience for architecture, is that we need to understand how the environment affects individuals, um, in order to design better, healthier, and more efficient spaces. So the whole idea is to begin with a, a deeper or a more complete understanding about our relationship with the physical environment. And one way to help us with that is through neuroscience. It's not the only way, but it's one way that can bring a lot of information, a lot of insights for us. The main question that I said I would bring here for us is what do we need from architecture or from the environment? And I would like to begin uh, answering this question in a very simple way. So let's not think necessarily about architecture just like in a general environment and a very simple way to start answering this question. So for instance, we can think like maybe the first thing for us to consider is that we need air because we can only stay a few minutes without air, otherwise we will have uh, health issues. And so this is something that we really need and that we all need. It doesn't matter if I am older or younger than you, if I am from a different country, we all have this uh, innate primitive need of air. This is a very basic um, uh, answer um, that I'm starting with. We can think about other simple things such as water. We can stand only three days without water or food. We can stand eight to 21 days without food. And we can keep going and bringing other elements to this answer, uh, elements that are not uh, needed in such a short time such as air. Like we can only stand a few minutes, otherwise we will die without air. But like there are things that we can stand longer periods of time without it. So three days for water, almost 21 days for food. And for other things that I will bring here, maybe we don't notice the same way as we will notice air because it's too immediate. But on the long term, 
I uh, defend that we need more things from the environment than just the basic ones that are very clear that if we don't have, we will have a, a health issue or, or die like this one. Uh, but there are other needs that are not so, so clear or so identifiable. So here I won't talk about these ones. I will just mention that these are examples of innate needs. So they are shared by all of us. We can have differences uh, in intensity. For instance, maybe I eat, I need to eat more than some of you, less than others of you. But even so, we all need food. We all need to eat to survive and to keep our health on the long term. Okay, but what about spatial design? How can we connect what I just said with spatial design? One way that I propose for us to connect, it is just one possible way. There are so many, it's hard to choose one. But one way uh, is through looking at the environment and how the environment affects us and what changes in our brain or in our whole organism if we don't uh, fulfill some kind of potential need that we have in relation to the environment. And I think these studies by Marion Diamond and her colleagues uh, can help us a lot with that. She studied enriched environments. Uh, so uh, environments for, uh, in, in her studies with rats, they were a cage uh, with uh, a set of stimuli that uh, would affect the brain in a physical way. So the structure of the brain would change. What does it mean? Uh, the brain is uh, capable of changing the connection between neurons, uh, so uh, making them stronger or making more of them or uh, losing them or making them weaker. And what she found out is that the physical environment can affect this, uh, this plasticity, this brain plasticity. And even more than that, she found out, as you can see here, that an enriched environment, such as this bigger cage here, can lead to neurons, so nervous cells in the brain that are stronger and, uh, and bigger and with more connections, as you can see in this image below here of a neuron. And what she found out also is that an impoverished cage would have the opposite effect. So it, will, it would not be a neutral environment. It would affect the brain, but in a negative way. So the brain would lose or the neurons would lose connections um, or weaken them. And this would result, of course, in change of behavior. So, so learning and memory would be uh, decreased as well as when in an enriched environment, they would be improved because of these changes in the brain. So here we can see that what we have in the environment can not just affect behavior, but uh, the structure of our brain and other things, not just the structure of the brain, but here in this study, uh, this is the main focus of the discussion. So the second idea that I propose is that architects and designers must be aware of the spatial qualities that we need from the environment. So what do we need from the environment? Those that can be combined to create spaces that support mental and physical health. So uh, the idea is to always think of uh, what people need from the environment and how can we combine different uh, qualities to fulfill different needs. So, okay, I will present here, if I, if I have time, I will keep looking the watch, of course, four elements to begin to answer this question. Of course, we could extend that and, and bring many other elements to our discussion. But the first one that I want to bring is natural light and dark. So we need the cycles of natural light and dark uh, to, uh, from the environment. We need that. That's how we synchronize our organism with the environment where we are through the cycles of light and dark. So this is what is called our biological clock. And here you can see a lot of studies showing some effects 
of the light in an environment in our biological clock in this kind of synchronization of internal activity with external environment. So, for instance, as I mentioned before, there are many studies pointing that sunlight can help and improve learning and memory. So a classroom that has more windows or bigger windows will help students to learn faster or better what they are uh, uh, seeing or discussing in their classes than a class that has less windows and more artificial light. Um, and the same way light is important for our peak of energy during the day, dark is also very important for sleep. And sleep is something we need uh, also. It's a primitive innate need. We all need it. Maybe I need less than some of you, more than others, but we all need to sleep. It's during sleep that we consolidate our memories. It's during sleep that the brain will uh, uh, restore itself and uh, be prepared for the next day. So the environment not only can affect our peak of energy with the amount of light during the day, and specifically natural light, which is the best, uh, but also it can affect our sleep quality during the night because uh, of uh, the lack of darkness. So when we have a TV, even if the TV is not on, but there is that there there are some small light. Uh, or a small light on the TV, or when our phone is charging and the light keeps doing like uh, blinking, or uh, or even the light from the city that enters our room through our window, which is uh, which is a kind of pollution, uh, luminosity pollution that is really discussed when we are talking about light as well. And there are many cities changing their night um, lighting because of the effects of them on sleep quality of their uh, of the people who live there. So here we can see some examples, the studies pointing us to the importance of an environment which offers darkness during the night and natural light during the day. But these are not the only points, uh, positive points uh, uh, related to natural light. It's not on, the only reason we need natural light. We also need it because it helps to improve, to increase serotonin levels. Serotonin uh, is a substance in our organism associated with feeling of well-being and happiness. And the lack of serotonin is associated with higher risk of depression. So this is something for us to pay attention, especially now that so many people are, suf are suffering with depression. And for instance, you can see this study that I'm showing here on my screen. It was made in Australia, and they found out that uh, this, so the amount of sunlight during the day can affect our feeling of well-being and happiness because of the difference in serotonin production uh, caused by the light, the natural light amount. So in uh, sunnier days, like uh, Maria said, you're having one in Stuttgart right now, sunnier days uh, or during sunnier days, people have higher levels of serotonin and they tend to be happier and feel better. And in darker days, so during the winter, colder days with not sun so much sunlight, the effect is the opposite. Decrease uh, in serotonin levels and people tend to feel more blue, and not so excited and happy like in sunny days. And what happens is it's not just the weather that can influence that. The amount of windows I am creating is allowing more natural light inside the building or not. So this will also have uh, an effect on serotonin production and consequently on feelings of well-being and, happy and happiness and so on. So this is another reason why we need natural light. And another one, because this is a very important topic, I think, another one is that natural light help us to produce uh, vitamin D, which is very, very important for our immunity, for bone health and muscle health. And it is really, really something that we need. And we don't have symptoms if we don't, if we don't have uh, enough vitamin D. So this is a problem. It's not something that you will start feeling that something is lacking. But on the long term, you might develop uh, health issues 
So for instance, when we are getting older, osteoporosis, because vitamin D is important for, for bone health, for instance. So this is something we need and that the sun can help us get because it's through the sun in our skin that we produce vitamin D. So that, those are the reasons why I am uh, pointing natural light as a need that we have in relation to the physical environment. Okay, we understand that, but while, what, how can design help? So let's, uh, let's see some, some ideas related to that. First thing, we as architects, we create the opportunities for people to be exposed to sunlight. So we create the windows, the amount of windows and uh, the size of the windows, uh, and this will affect the amount of natural light that, will, uh, uh, that people will be exposed to. So we can create more and larger windows because we know this is a need and people are each time more spending more and more time indoors. Uh, we spend around 90% of our time indoors instead of outdoors. So this is something for us to consider. If people are staying indoors, how can we bring the sun indoors and through windows and zenithal and atriums and things like that, we can improve the amount of natural light inside our buildings. So, and not just that, but we can think about a layout that will guide people to stay more, uh, uh, to stay closer to the windows instead of far away. So maybe in an office, if I get the tables where people will work, the desks, only in the center of the building, the windows will be there, but people will not be close enough to the windows to get the best from them. Uh, so maybe if we change the layout and create some areas like this that bring more opportunity for people to stay closer to the windows, this is another way to be uh, combined with the first, the first one. So more create more windows, larger windows, and change of layout to bring people to such windows. So just the windows without people next to them will not be enough. The more strategies we can combine together, the better. So here, another example on how we can get people to them, bring some way to use the space very uh, close to the window. And of course, I know people are spending more and more time indoors, but we can try to change that. Even if it doesn't work uh, perfectly, we can keep trying because we know it is important, not just for the sunlight, but for the contact with nature, which is also some, something very important. I won't have time to discuss here, but we need nature too. So we can create more opportunities that draw people outdoors. So this here, this picture is an example of a Wunerf, which is a shared road um, that will create a safer space for pedestrians or children to play in the street instead of play in their living room, for instance. So we can think about solutions that will uh, create better space outdoors. So maybe people will choose outdoors instead of indoors a little bit more at least. Here is another example. So a shared road is one example for pedestrians to feel safer and use more the streets. Uh, but here is a parklet uh, that is also an example to create in the sidewalks, a great opportunity for people not just to walk, but maybe you're tired, you can sit there, you can read a book, you can, I don't know, wait for a while and rest. So this is another idea that we can think to create an opportunity to bring people outdoors. With playgrounds, uh, we have also other opportunities to bring children uh, outdoors. And we must not forget that the idea is not just about natural light, but also about darkness. So we need to think about how to create darker rooms. And this is something for us to consider uh, in a room, a room in a home, at home, but also for us to consider in a hospital or in a hotel, for instance. And it's a real challenge to make hospital uh, rooms darker because of course we need the light of the equipment for nurses and doctors and so on. Going to our second, uh, our second need, body movement. So we need opportunities to move our bodies. So here are examples of studies showing that when we just for walking, I'm not just going, I'm, I'm not going to say that we need to go to the gym because this is an extreme example, but just walking or climbing the stairs can help us to improve uh, blood flow to the brain. 
so we have more fuel to think and we will think better there are studies here proving that uh, that creativity improves after a walk or learning and also walking can affect our uh, mood in a general way and our stress levels and risk of depression so again depression here a topic uh, relevant and then we will see how architecture can uh, affect that and help to decrease risks of future depression. So there are many studies pointing that uh, physical activity, so just walking or climbing the stairs, can reduce stress levels and can um, improve feelings of well-being and production of, of serotonin and dopamine, which are uh, serotonin I just mentioned, related to happiness. Dopamine is associated with pleasure. And there are also studies pointing that physical exercise, physical activity affects brain plasticity. So when we saw this Marion Diamond study with the rats, they had the opportunity to, to exercise in their the, the wheel and with all the toys that they had in their cages. And we need exercise to improve brain, brain plasticity as well. So there are many positive effects that were already proven that we get when we uh, walk more or climb the stairs. Again, how can design help? Through rethinking circulation systems. So all the circulation, circulation systems from streets to stairs to corridors and so on, we can create what is called active design, which is a design that supports movement. So we, we can induce, induce people to exercise more. For instance, this is an example, uh, just by changing the appearance of such stairs in the uh, exits of subways, uh, both studies found out uh, that this change increased, uh, increased uh, the use of traditional stairs instead of escalators. And you can see here that the numbers are really significant. It's not, it is not just 10%. We are talking about oops, something around 60% increase in the use of traditional stairs. So here you can see a piano stair in which when you step, you have the sound of the note. But here you can see a simple, uh, simpler, a more, a more simple solution uh, with just colors in the stair. So we can change appearance, location, and other things in order to improve uh, healthier behaviors. We can also rethink distances of spaces. So if, uh, if we think in the urban level, if I have something that is too distant, maybe I will get my car to go. Uh, but if it's too close, maybe I won't have to move at all. So we have to be careful to find uh, uh, an interesting distance that will not make people give up on walking, but also that will help them to walk a little bit and not just stay in the same place and find everything that they need. We can also think about furniture uh, as a way to improve uh, body activity uh, and, and movement. So you can see here desks that allow you to work standing and other kinds of stairs that will give you other opportunities to use your body. And going here to our uh, last one, I know I am running out of time here. I would just talk about this one and conclude. Uh, the third need that I would like to point is emotional attachment. So this one is maybe more subjective but we can see that there are many studies as well pointing to the importance of emotional attachment uh, uh, for our well-being and health in general. So there are also studies pointing that emotional attachment and familiarity can help us reduce stress levels. Maybe you're asking, why are you so worried about stress? Because I'm talking about stress a lot in the examples I'm giving, because stress is the greatest enemy of brain plasticity. Stress has the opposite effect. It will decrease brain plasticity. We can lose neurons and uh, lose connections between neurons if we are dealing with chronic stress, long-term stress. So that's why architecture uh, in my opinion, when through architecture, we help to reduce stress levels, we are automatically helping to improve brain plasticity, okay? Uh, here, there are other studies pointing that we have preference uh, in stressful situations. We have a preference for things that are familiar. And also another uh, other studies pointing that we can create a community sense 
and make people care more for their uh, building and surrounding surroundings through uh, emotional attachment. So we need to create this kind of positive connection to, um, to have such uh, positive effects that it can bring to us. And this is also so a consider a need that we have. We need to have uh, emotional attachment between people, so social emotional attachment, but also spatial emotional attachment. And how can design help us achieve this? We can, first of all, think about two options here. We can create new attachment. So I can create a new building or a new neighborhood and bring elements that will pay, make people uh, feel attached to this new element, this new building, this new room in the building or this new neighborhood. But I can also uh, combine with that the use of what already exists. So maybe I find that my the users of the space I'm creating, they like some kind of music or in their uh, childhood they have some they had some kind of experience and I can bring this existing element that I know is already positive for them I can bring this symbol or this color or this vegetation to my environment to make this emotional link with people and this will help them to feel attached to a new environment so we can create a new attachment and we can use elements that had already a positive emotional attachment. So to conclude this part here, uh, we need to understand the different groups of users of the space we will create and look for common elements of positive valence. What do I mean with this? When we are creating a space such as a hospital or a school, we are talking about many people using this space. It's different from a home that maybe four or five people will be using th that space. So it's a greater challenge to find elements that create emotional attachment to many, many people. So we need to understand, we need to group the different kinds of users to understand different emotional elements for each of my group. So maybe for instance, I can get this grouping uh, thinking about age. So children, adults, and elderly. And this will help me to think about what cultural elements from, I don't know, 50 years ago, they used to have uh, they, and they love. And maybe for us, they don't have any meaning, but for the elderly people using my space, this will have a lot of meaning, a lot of emotional attachment. This is one way to like help me to think about all the kinds of users and uh, how to help fulfill this specific need for each one of them. So what is meaningful in a positive way for each group of uh, users I am detecting? What are their best memories, their tastes, their values uh, that can inspire me to bring better solutions for my design that will create more emotional attachment? Yohani Palasma, has a quote that I, among many that I love. He says, cultural identity, a sense of having roots and belonging is the irreplaceable ground of our own humanity. So we need to think uh, when we're talking about neuroscience for architecture, there are more objective things that we can uh, think of such as lighting, but there are more subject, uh, subjective ones such as emotional attachment, that, that are as important as uh, the others. So we must always try to bring this cultural identity to the designs we create. The seventh idea here that I want to propose, now I'm uh, just closing my conclusion here. Uh, again, Yohani Palasma, a, a different quote by uh, Yohani Palasma. He said, the existential experience of the human being is the first object of the art of building. And I would like to add something to that. So this is my, uh, my ad addition. Um, uh, and such experience is deeply affected by mental health and well-being. So when we are talking about a positive existential experience that is induced, is stimulated through the environment, we also need to consider environments that support mental health and well-being. Therefore, we must keep in mind that although neuroscience brings us a lot of insights, which it, it does like a lot, we are not designing just for brains. 
We are designing for human beings in their full complexity. So we need to be very careful when we are discussing and applying neural architecture. Here is just a sum up of everything I said. And as I mentioned before, there are many other points that I could have brought here uh, related to how the environment can help us to fulfill our primitive innate needs. So there are more elements than just the ones that I mentioned. Uh, Richard Neutra has another quote to inspire us here in this end of conversation. He said that the fact that a man does not realize the harmfulness of a product or a design element in his surroundings does not mean that it is harmless. So sometimes we habituate to something that is not good to us. So maybe I'm used to work here at home with my windows closed and I don't realize I need sunlight, but this does not mean that I'm not being negatively affected by the lack of it. So we really need to be careful because our clients, they will not know such needs. They will not ask for this because they are not consciously aware of this need. And just really finally now, we need much more than what was mentioned here. Just this point, I need to make it clear. But the idea, the main idea here was not to give all the answers, but to let you know the importance uh, to make this question more often. We need to make it more often, uh, knowing that part of the answer will always change depending on who the users are and how they are using or they will use the space. So I mentioned age, for instance. So what a, maybe an example, what a five years old child will need from a classroom will be different from what a 15 years old teenager will need from the same space because their age is different, their organism is different. And not only that, but maybe the same person, the same person using um, a space, uh, a room in a different way will have different needs. So for instance, I just mentioned that we need darkness in our uh, bedroom, but if I'm using my bedroom to study or to work, I will need something else because I'm not using it only for uh, to sleep. So we need always to think and to consider this, who are the users and how they will use the space. We must keep in mind that science and of course neuroscience can inform us on that a lot, but not a hundred percent. We also need always uh, to keep an attentive eye and ears to understand the people who will occupy the spaces we create. So we need to go there. We need to talk to people. We need to observe them to learn. It's not just through scientific papers that we learn. We need to use scientific papers, of course, I brought many of them, but we need to combine this with observation, with discussions with people to get to know them uh, and understand them in a more, uh, in a deeper way. With that, I will conclude here. Uh, once again, you can see here uh, the, the QR code for the website and later I can share with you my email. So if, like, I hope now you will have questions for me, but if you forget something and you think about the question later, you can always write to me. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful, Andrea. Thank you so much for this really comprehensive and really interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I will also try to stick, stick to the time. And I was very carefully turning on the lights here in the room because as you were talking <laughs> exactly about the circadian rhythm, uh, our lights were getting darker and darker outside. And I thought, this is a dilemma because I need the lights for us to be visible here to each other in the room and also in the camera. But I'm thinking that I'm disturbing the sleep cycle of everybody here. So <laughs> very enlightening. Wonderful. Uh, uh, and this is the first conversation we have here also with the group and a wonderful intro introduction here to our students to see in this uh, beautiful systematized way, a very concrete examples of which parameters of our built environment we can already work with to have a direct impact in the health and well-being of the users. So this connection with the light, of course, I had already, while you were talking, written here, and which would be the parameters that can enrich the environment when you showed us these slides with the, with the images of the rats uh, in the cages. And then, of course, you gave already all the answers. It was, uh, it was a really good way to start. So I would pick it up from there. Uh, because I think our students were also curious when they saw the, the comparison with the, 
with the red brain. And we will have Kate Jeffrey, who is a specialist and uh, she works with rats and studies <coughs> with rats. So Andrea, maybe you could talk a little bit more about why the red brains are interesting to make a comparison with the brains of the humans, just to give a little more insight. Sure, of course. Thank you, Maria. And well, first thing, uh, since we are all mammals, there are many similarities between our brains. But the positive thing about rat brain is that they are much more simple than our brain. So it's easier to start studying with rats and then bring the studies to our human uh, context, of course. So if the study was only made with rats, we need to be careful to assume it's going to work with us as well. But for instance, this one that I'm bringing about enriching environments, they were first made with rats, but nowadays we know that the human brain, the human adult brain also has this uh, capacity of, of uh, producing new neurons in specific areas, such as the hippocampus, and also of changing uh, connections between neurons. So the positive thing with the rats is that uh, is the simplicity. It's easier to work with them. They have a shorter life uh, span, so it's easier to create a long-term experiment with them. With us, we, it would take like 50, 60, 70 years, years to create a long-term experiment. So maybe uh, it is too, it's much more complicated with us. And Maria, you mentioned that you would ask, you were going to ask me about enriched environments and the parameters. And I didn't give you all the answers, mm -hmm. but in a general way, uh, the, the best way to answer what elements in the environment can help to create an enriched one, so an environment that will improve, uh, stimulate brain plasticity, we can think about four general uh, uh, answers here. So, uh, uh, um, how can I say? Social uh, stimuli. So we need other people. We need connection with um, uh, connection. We also need uh, refuge spaces and privacy. But the challenges brought by social connection they are very important for a brain plasticity. So this was something I didn't mention in my talk. But we need social stimuli. We need uh, stimuli for our body. So this one I, I mentioned, and I mentioned that you can find that in the red uh, cage picture that I mentioned, uh, that I brought here. So social connection, uh, we need body movement, we need um, multisensory stimuli, so stimuli for all the senses, and with architecture we can bring that, because with, for instance, nature, we are not only changing uh, what people see, but the air quality, the smell, the sound of the space will change depending on the vegetation we can bring to the space. And finally, we need cognitive stimuli as well. So this, the combination of four, and through architecture, we can bring four because with architecture, we create opportunities for social connection. connection. So we can bring uh, more opportunities for different kinds of social connections. So for a quick meeting, informal meeting at university in the stairs, for instance, or a private meeting in a room or a huge meeting with a lot of people. So we, we can create different opportunities for um, cognitive stimuli, for body movement, social connection and, and multisensory stimuli. These are these are really great uh, great hints. Uh, I, I would just like to make a, a bit of a more challenging question now because in many in many of the slides and this is also one of the questions which I which I have faced at some point in my work because I, I developed a project with some of my students in Kaiserslautern which which was called Mean Chairs and they were challenged to design these chairs that would not allow the user to sit for a long time so they would have to constantly move and so on and um and after some time i started to think that it's we all we need to create spaces that challenge and also give opportunity to users to move but we also need to have a consideration that people have different movement needs and there are also people who are very lazy and they are happy about being lazy and uh, we, need, we need to find a fine balance between giving the stimulation and the opportunity of movement, but also understanding that everybody has different needs and different rhythms. And there are people who by their own disposition are more sedentary and like to just be more quiet and less, less um, active. And I think that one, uh, it's also really interesting, uh, a concept that has appeared uh, in, the, in the last years, 
It's very inspired by all these discussions we have now around body shaming and all these different things. And I, I find this uh, uh, theme, uh, this uh, term of fat phobia, very interesting because for one side we do have, of course, the health concerns about uh, obesity and we know that uh, of, of all the health problems which are associated with it. But at the same time, we also know that we are living in a culture that really uh, makes a lot of pressure for people to have a certain degree or a certain image of fitness. And that image also has a lot of commercial interest behind it. So how can we as architects promote a way of dealing with space and interacting with space that is a more inclusive perspective? Okay. I love your question. And I think in your question, you brought more like uh, elements that I, if I had time, I could like keep talking and talking forever. You brought more elements that I would uh, use as answers to my question about what we need from the environment. So when you were talking, you, you mentioned about balance. You, you talked about balance. Uh, and we need a dynamic balance for everything in our life. So for instance, I said natural light is very important, but if we don't have darkness, this is not balanced and this is not positive at all. We need natural light, but we need dark. So it's a dynamic balance that we keep changing all the time. So one way to deal with um, this through architecture, through, with this question that you brought is through understanding the idea of a dynamic balance, not just a general balance. Like I will give you like a half lit environment so you will have like half dark and half light there no you you need like a dynamic one a lot of light and no darkness and the opposite and you keep like in cycles you can find that so one one way is through this balance that you you mentioned it yourself and another way is uh through diversity we if we bring more diversity to our design people can choose more options so instead of creating, I don't know, um, a space, maybe a workspace only with like very uh, well lit environment, maybe I can have a room that is a little bit darker because some people can have like light phobia or sensibility to light. So they mm -hmm. can choose from it. So instead of creating homoge two homogeneous spaces, if we bring more diversity to our design, we can give the option for people to choose from and uh, the perception of choice is really, really important for stress control and for our general health. So you don't need to give like all the options, but if at least you give two options and people can choose from them, this is already, uh, this gives a sense, a perception of choice. And this will like improve the experience people will have in your building. So my answer would be through dynamic balance. So always when you're thinking about diversity, think about offering like different things to uh, to complement uh, each other. And, and yes, more options, more choice uh, to people. Great, this, this is exactly a brilliant answer, uh, Andrea. And I know that it was a tricky one. <laughs> <laughs> You, you managed it, you managed it uh, very well, because also the way you described it, I think it gives our students already, they can visualize the options of what it means to think about modulating a space that invites different users with all different sorts of bodies and needs and aptitudes to, to relate to space. Um, and just one thing I would like to add, we need to be careful with something. We are, and like all of us, I think, in my opinion, we are getting a little bit too spoiled. So for instance, I can have delivery and uh, I like, I don't need to go to places anymore because I can get them, like I can buy clothes online and so on. This is great to make our life more practical. So I'm not criticizing this, but this is also making us more spoiled. So even when I have time to go to the supermarket, maybe I'm like, oh, you said like, People, some people are lazier than others. And I'm like, oh, why walk to the supermarket? I can, I don't know, ask mm -hmm. with a delivery and so on. And we need to be careful because too much uh, of uh, this kind of uh, spoiling can lead to uh, be a, a behavior and habits that are not as healthy for us. Um, so we need architecture that challenges us as well. Not all the time. We need familiarity and places to relax but we also need challenge. So your mean chairs are, are a good example of that. 
we need spaces, some kind of spaces or furniture that will help us not to be spoiled all the time. We have we need dynamic balance. So I need spoil, spoiling time, but I also need a time to be challenged. And this is one way to stimulate the brain, cognitive challenge. So we need to keep challenging people. So I like your mean chairs example because it's one way to, to do that. Yes, and, and we also in the summer, we, we were lucky to meet with Galen and she also gave lots lots of examples for those who, who don't know you can watch in the youtube channel corporeal architecture there's a conversation there with galen krenz and of course you should read her book the chair which talks a lot about the ethics of of sitting from the perspective of uh, body conscious design and now i would give the word to our students to come here and uh, make questions who would like to start <laughs> We just need a little time for them to come here close. We have a meeting owl, which has two bright light eyes. <laughs> so owl sound in the beginning. Let's go ahead. Hi, so I have a new question regarding light in the night in the cities, because cities are also getting more conscious that especially women, but also other people aren't feeling safe in dark places and also lighting up some spaces for them to feel more safe. So that's kind of a conflict. So how do you respond to that? Okay, great question. Uh, what's your name? I'm Catherine. Catherine, thank you for your question. Uh, I think there are two answers for it. First of all, it's not about just like uh, decreasing the amount of light, but it's about the quality of light that we choose to our cities. So for instance, Los Angeles is changing or changed already their city lighting uh, from more a whiter, a white kind of light to a, a more yellow light, because this kind of light, yellow light, they have less emission of blue light. And blue light is the one that can uh, affect our circadian rhythm, rhythm at the most. So the light, the kind of light that we need to be like the most careful is with blue light. So just by changing the quality of light, the amount can still be the same, but the, the quality of light changing, this will affect us differently. So this is one way. And the other way to combine with that is through a uh, smart city solution. So for instance, you can use uh, technology and IoT and for instance, to bring sensors to the to this uh, public area so this light is not so intense when nobody's there but if the sensor uh, senses some kind of movement maybe a car maybe a peep, a person the light will like uh, increase again so we can combine both things or choose from them but like the more we combine i think it's better but then it is a way to create a safe space uh, which is also very important but also not to disturb our circadian rhythms as we are disturbing now. So a little bit less at least. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is a very good question. Another question. Something, something that came up during, during the talk or if you're curious about any aspect of it, you have the opportunity now. Maybe they need a little more time to think. So I would also open open up to the audience because we have many guests here. And maybe in the meantime, our students can think of another question. Should take advantage of, of the time that Andrea is here and that she's giving also very good answers. So I would like to ask uh, our audience if anyone would like to make a question also, please go ahead. I have a question. Yes, can you introduce yourself, please? Yes, I'm my Goyal. name is uh, yes, my name is Vinod Goyal. Uh, uh, that was a great talk, uh, Andrea. Thank you, uh, and I ninety nine percent with what you say I agree with, but I have one question and a, a bit of a comment. So my my key question is about at the beginning where you sort of connect the neuroscience to the architecture, and you said the results are not sufficient for architects. We need to know something. So, so the behavioral results themselves are not sufficient. We know, need to know something about the underlying neuroscience. Why is that? And okay. let, me, oh, well, uh, let, let me just maybe add a little bit more to it. 
So then you give the example of the rats the, in the enriched environment, a very famous, uh, uh, well-known study. And you show, I mean, that's a striking image, right? This is what caught everyone's attention with that study is you show the images of the, the, the two neurons from the enriched environment and the impoverished environment. But why is the, uh, uh, the image with the more uh, bushy dendrites uh, a better uh, neuron than the other one? Okay. Why do we conclude that? Okay, good question, Vinod. Maybe I will forget the second one, so I will need your help to remind me. But going to well, the this, first they're, one. they're the same. I mean, th that was just an example of the first question. Uh, oh, okay. But I will try to answer them maybe in a separate way, and later we can connect both. Okay. But the first one about uh, why we need to go beyond just the result. Uh, I, I just wanted to instigate people to think that uh, we need to not we don't have to be satisfied with just one answer like oh I changed this in the environment and I observed that uh, result and now I have some I don't know an interesting finding we need to go beyond that and the deeper our understanding of the entire process so uh, if I understand not just that natural light improves learning, but what is happening inside our brains, what, why learning is improved when we have more natural light. So maybe the chemical and I don't know, something else. So this is what I want to instigate people to think, uh, to, to have a, a more systemic understanding of the whole and not just like a punctual answer to, okay, to anything. But now but now go back to the neuroscientist doing that experiment on the rats. Yes. How do they conclude that that one neuron is more desirable than the other neuron? They're just looking at the behavior. You can just, that's the only thing you can do. It always comes down to the behavior. And so uh, if uh, you want to argue that somehow by looking at what's going on in the brain, you get a deeper understanding. You do as a neuron in terms of if your question is, how does the brain work, right? But in terms of what's happening there, whether it's desirable, whether it's undesirable, all we can do is look at the behavior, correlate those brain processes with behavior. Uh, I mean, it, the, one of the most famous studies, and uh, uh, you, know, you remember the studies with the, uh, Blake Moore and Cooper in the 1970s with the kittens, uh, when they put them in the, um, uh, the room with the stripes, the vertical stripes and the horizontal stripes. Now, there were two things that were reported in that study. Uh, the, um, so the, the kittens that were put in the room with the vertical stripes, they, they looked at their, uh, what happened to the uh, organization uh, of the visual cortex and then with the horizontal stripes. But you could find differences in organization of visual cortex, but unless you also find differences in behavior, those differences in organizational in the, in the brain are irrelevant. You don't know whether they're good, they're bad, they're, uh, it's always correlated back to behavior. And, and so that I think is really key here. And in fact, you come to this at the end when you say the science is not enough, you have to understand people. Mm -hmm. I think this is what you're saying. So, um, yeah, no, that, that was my sort of uh, uh, question is to think a little deeper about what um, uh, sort of this connection is and what it's giving us. Uh, and one other comment uh, with respect to plasticity, the, this I think is one of the most misunderstood parts uh, of neuroscience. Plasticity, uh, I mean, you mentioned that one little thing. The, uh, you, you know, the, first of all, plasticity only works, it's a real thing, only in uh, prior to maturation, during maturation windows, right? With those kittens, if you put them in that box after the maturation window, there is no plasticity. Same with us, different parts of the brain have different windows, but it only works within windows. And so it's not a long-term thing, uh, even with association cortex. And, uh, so, and then what you mentioned with the hippocampus, that's like 1% and we have no idea what those neurons actually do. So the, the, I, I know many neuroscientists themselves, when they talk about plasticity, we're sort of eternal optimists. And we want to think 
that we had this enormous degree of plasticity in our brain. It's not true. Um, so just the, the, the uh, uh, that was just a second, that's just a comment. Uh, I mean, it doesn't really affect your talk, but the first one, I think uh, um, without the behavior, and that's what the results are. So you can do the behavioral studies and get the results. And this is desirable behavior, this is undesirable behavior. And then you go back and see what's happening in the brain, but you can only figure out what's, I mean, make sense of what's happening in the brain by looking at the behavior. And so I'm saying as an architect, can't I just look at the behavioral studies and get everything I need to do what you said architecture do, which was, I thought that was just perfect. I mean, that's exactly what architects are in the business of doing. Yeah, that was, uh, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, Vinod. And uh, I, really, I really like your comment. And I think uh, for like, especially the first one that you said like, oh, but it's all related to behavior. I think we agree uh, on that my choice about starting my talk about uh, talking uh, uh, saying that we need to go beyond behavior is that from my perspective as an architect and as a professor with my students, what I see is that most of my students, they are architects and designers. So they don't come with a neuroscience background. And what I see is that they, they are too focused on like just one result in the behavior. So I, try to make this path and go back to behavior in the end because it is important and it is all about that. But I just tried to keep some, to bring some kind of challenge in the beginning of the discussion. So like we can understand the whole of the, 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 whole, the role of behavior, but uh, we can also understand that uh, it is, it will bring more a complete a more complete understanding if we think about the process as a whole and not just uh, behavior. That that was it. But I, I think uh, at least from what I've heard you saying, I think we agree on that. It was just mm -hmm. a choice yeah. on on the path I was going to take to to come to my conclusion. Yeah. And so yeah, no. If the point is that it's good to know something about the neural basis, I no, that's perfectly. Uh, uh, that's correct. And I think it's a laudable uh, thing to do. But if the point was that somehow the, the neural insight is giving us something that the behavior is not, then uh, oh, no. uh, that needs to be sort of rethought, I think, because even uh, um, you know, as neuroscientists, all we can do, we're looking at the behavior. It's all about the behavior. And then we're just doing correlations back from the behavior to the, uh, um, to the neural systems. Okay, uh, so th thank you very much, Vinod, for, for being here today. I am again very honored. And of course, for having this, your, your challenging uh, questions and, and commentaries, because it also elevates uh, the, the quality and it matches the quality of Andreas's uh, presentation. And also, uh, our students don't, uh, don't know, but Vinod Goel is a very renowned neuroscientist who has done lots of consistent work over the years and really important research. So we are very lucky that also he is here to, to join us today and gives us the, the insight from neuroscience. Science. And I was also very interested, interested now in listening also from the perspective of neuroscience, um, the possible limitations of the whole idea of neuroplasticity, which is actually the main idea that we're working here in the class. We have an assignment where students are working uh, with, uh, with the concept of repurposing materials to change our effective connection, for example, to waste material and to buildings such as ruins and to create uh, new positive effective uh, links with this kind of problematic aspects of, of building and also of the environment. And also consider- Maria, if, yes. sorry, if you're interested more in the plasticity, uh, there's a couple of chapters in my book, new book that deal with it. I could send them to you if you like. Uh, yes, yeah, absolutely. And you know, send me an email afterwards and I'll have your email address and I'll be happy to send them to you. I will, and I will also invite you for summer for a conversation. Okay. <laughs> I, I hope you will, you will join us. I would be very glad. Thank you. Uh, and I would also last, uh, ask, finally, we are already maybe reaching the end. And I also, I don't want to make uh, Andrea sit in the hot seat for too long. <laughs> It got really warm today also, man. And I, I wanted to, to ask if anyone else in the audience and also from our students, if there would be one final question. Here, here in the room, not. Okay, we are just starting. It's the first session. 
and in the audience. Um, oh, Maria and Andrea, can you hear me? Yes, yes, go ahead. Yeah, so I want to thank Maria for opening yet another amazing cycle of conversations. Tatiana, and can you please you want... introduce yourself? Because this group of students doesn't know you yet. Sure. Uh, so my name is uh, Tatiana Berger, and I'm an architect, urban planner, and also a professor of architecture. Um, I help to coordinate the recent uh, Moving Boundaries uh, summer course, which some of you attended, and it's great to see some of you here. And I also lead ACE, which is the ANFA Center for Education. So um, I want to thank Andrea for, for a very inspiring lecture. And Andrea, your lectures are always so engaging and so clear, incredibly easy to follow with practical advice, right? Which I really, really appreciate. And, you know, I learned a lot today, uh, but one of the really important points that, that was made, I think, is that, um, if I can make it a little more concise, is that the user is never passive in a space, right? The user is also a designer, a co-creator, we might say, right? So there's this dialogue between the architect, the interior designer, and the user, the inhabitant of that space. And the space is constantly changing, as you mentioned, right? It's a dynamic relationship. And I think that when we look at our traditional uh, architecture education in schools that you know, we all know can, can be quite limiting. We don't talk about that enough, right? We don't talk about the, that we need to allow the user to also shape his or her own space. We talked about diversity and inclusion today and thank you for Maria for mentioning that. So I think that the first point is that we need to offer multiple options in each space, a kind of a layering of space so that people can move from one space to the next, maybe that has more light or more darkness. And in addition, have the power, give them the power to shape and manipulate their own space because those needs are also changing, right? And so the second important point I think Andrea made is that we need to observe. The observation is such an incredible skill for a young architect or designer, and that needs to be taught better in our schools, right? So it's not just trusting the evidence. Yes, of course, we have to be aware of, of the studies and the evidence, but to complement that in real time, we need to know how to observe, what questions to ask, and then to go back to the information, go back to the studies and, and update that. So, so the work of architecture really has a life that goes on that we need to learn from, come back to it all the time and learn from it. When I worked with Alvaro Siza, I learned so much from him because he did that with each of his buildings. He would go back, you know, next year, five years later and learn from the way that people were using that space and then do it differently next time or even change that same building. Uh, so lots, lots to think about and thank you so much, Andrea. I re really enjoyed it today. Thank you, Tatiana, and thank you for like, like making everything that I said in a very concise and objective way. Uh, it, it is helpful to have that after so much talking, like to like a sum up uh, with that. Well, it's really, it's just like such a strong idea, and you said it, is that the, <laughs> the user is a co-creator, right? We don't just finish a space and we give it, you know, here, here it is. Uh, but it is constantly being manipulated uh, and shaped and, and even redesigned. And we should allow that to happen. We should offer those options, right? Great, Tatiana, thank you. This is a really, uh, really important question. And it's also something that I always try to bring in class here with the students. And that's why we are working in this exercise that it's the same mm -hmm. conceptual task for everyone, but then we have all these different uh, interpretations. And I know that there was one lingering question from Yolanda, I believe. And I would just ask maybe very, very quickly because we need to finish here in the room. Everybody's already putting the pencils in the pencil case, <laughs> Not very, very subtly. <laughs> so please Yolanda, go ahead. Um, hello, my name is uh, Yolanda. I used to be a student of Pirat as well. Thank you for inviting me today, by the way. <laughs> 
Wonderful to see you here. And honestly, since I know my question could take up a while, <laughs> I think that this might be better left to an email, if that's okay with Andrea. <laughs> I wanted to ask about methods uh, of this. Um, I uh, wanted to ask about, uh, wanted to go back to the topic of balance that uh, we were discussing with Devad earlier and how to find a balance between that subjective identification with the space and the scientific approach of the design of the spaces. Um, how to balance that human aspect of the approach uh, towards a person and the implementation of the information acquired through through the scientific method i think unless there unless there's something quick i'd be happy to continue that conversation per email <laughs> uh do i have time to start answering like quickly and then we can keep yes, going yes. <laughs> One minute. <laughs> okay, no, I will be quick because this is a very complex question and maybe I don't think there is just one answer to it. Uh, but I would say that the, in my view, in my in my understanding, the best way to find some kind of balance is that this scientific learning, this at least uh, as an architect, I know that I was never taught to look for scientific studies in your science or psychology or cognitive science. So what I try to do with my students is to teach them that this, there is all the whole possibility of scientific studies that can help us a lot understand about human experience, can help us a lot, but not 100%. So I would say if we can um, include this kind of human studies in, uh, during our undergraduation course, we will start practicing more prepared. And we also need to include in our studies uh, an understanding on methods to understand to how we can learn more about the specific users of our spaces. So for instance, user journey and creation of personas or interview, interview techniques or observation techniques, this is something that at least from like from my background here in Brazil, I never had like some kind of training on that when I was in my undergraduation course. So I think this is a discussion that has to start there. It will not finish there. Of course, we need to keep learning and discussing and studying, uh, but it has to start during undergraduation course, like these two discussions in parallel scientific one to understand about methods of research experiment ex experimentation and so on and methods to like just observe as an art not as an, a scientist you are you're not going to publish this but how do you observe like uh Tatiana said Caesar uh, used to do with his buildings so like this these two things in parallel since undergraduation course I think would be like my uh understanding of how to answer your question but Thank we can keep this uh, through to uh, okay. through email. <laughs> Great. Uh, so we we have to finish for now because I, I don't want to make my students stay here under the artificial light for too long. And also, Andrea, thank you so much for being with us today and sharing your work. I find it wonderful because you always bring very uh, substantiated uh, research. But I also love the passionate and enthusiastic way with which you always always present your your research. And I know that you're also teaching. And I can with many many so many students as we said in the beginning. And I can totally understand why. So <laughs> thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, thank you, Maria. Thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure to talk to you and see the, the and answer the questions. And ah, can you hear? Ah, thank you. <laughs> there were you. real ones. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank and you. please feel free to write to me if you have any further questions, anything you you want to discuss. It's a pleasure to keep like I'm here to discuss. I love this topic, and it is always a pleasure to have opportunities such as this one. So thank you so much, Maria. <laughs> thank you, Andrea, and thank you all to everybody in the audience for joining us. And next week we have one more conversation, and you can also just catch up on YouTube after after Monday. There is a weekly weekly upload. So bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye bye. Thank you.